So in this uh, final video lesson on time series econometrics, uh, we will look into the topic of time series forecasting. And uh, forecasting is of course very uh, topical theme at the moment. Uh, there is a lot of hype about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques in the so-called predictive analytics. And uh, very often actually in the master's thesis uh, in business analytics, uh, our students have compared the performance of uh, machine learning techniques and, uh, and more conventional time series forecasting methods. Uh, very often, for example, so-called ARIMA model, so that refers to uh, autoregressive integrated moving average. So um, I would argue that there's a lot, of, uh, lot that can be learned uh, from uh, econometrics in terms of uh, forecasting. So uh, in economics, uh, there has been, of course, the, the, the forecasting of uh, uh, economic uh, cycles, uh, inflation forecasting, unemployment forecasting, and these sort of topics have been a very long-standing theme. And unfortunately, economic profession has a very lousy track record in, in uh, being able to forecast, for example, recessions or economic shocks. So in my view, this is mainly because uh, Forecasting the future is just extremely hard, whatever methods you uh, might want to use. So uh, several decades ago, there was a lot of optimism in economics that, uh, that building some uh, uh, large uh, optimization based models uh, based on economic theory would help to help to, for example, uh, forecast the business cycle and forecast the recession. But, uh, but as I mentioned already, uh, those models uh, tend to fail quite miserably. And it turned out that, uh, that relatively simple time series models actually tend to beat this kind of um, optimization based models uh, very often. So that's one, one lesson from the, from the history of, uh, of uh, economic forecasting, which could be also useful in the, in the context of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning type of applications. So uh, to set some general principles, uh, we will focus now on the, on the very simple uh, autoregressive model AR1 that we have considered already before. And I will also use this kind of ARDL, so autoregressive distributed lag model, to also look at, uh, okay, could some additional information besides this own past of, of this uh, variable Y help to improve the forecast? So. I will illustrate this, uh, this uh, um, forecasting in using the application of the inf inflation forecasting. So we will use this inflation series of Finland that we considered before. But uh, for any type of uh, predictive analytics, uh, uh, an important concept to, to be aware of is the so-called out-of-sample validation. So um, when I do this kind of forecasting, then uh, it is important to divide this our, our time series in two parts that I have here indicated by red color and blue color. So the first period, what I have called the estimation period or, or in-sample uh, in data is uh, the, the data set that I will use for uh, estimating the parameters of the model. So in the case of the um, AR1 model that we considered, so those would be the drift parameter mu and the autoregressive coefficient rho. So I'll come back to that later. So then in the second part of the sample, what I call this out of sample period or validation period, indicated by the blue color, then I do not estimate anything, but I just use those, uh, those parameter values estimated uh, in this, uh, in this uh, red period and um, I will just take those as given and I will use them to then make a forecast and then I use this blue period to test that how well this uh, forecast is actually working. What is this kind of uh, uh, prediction error giving those, those parameter estimates? So this validation period is then very important to, to see that, okay, how well this uh, model is able to, to predict the out of sample rather than in sample because any, any regression method uh, is going to maximize the fit within this in-sample period, but, uh, but then being able to uh, 
also fitted also also predicted in, in out of sample it's important so there is this important concept of uh, overfitting that can occur in this in sample period and the use of the validation period is then uh, sort of protecting us against this kind of uh, overfitting and in particular this overfitting is of course important reason why for example some uh, very complicated models tend to fail in forecasting purposes and relatively simple models perform better so I come back to that uh, that shortly, but uh, I will use this um, this uh, uh, Finnish inflation data to illustrate this uh, this uh, estimation and validation, and I will also introduce then this uh, sunspot uh, sunspot data, and uh, I will ask the question that does this sunspot data actually help to improve the forecast or not? So of course in the in sample period, this estimation period introducing some additional information will always uh, always improve your in-sample fit but uh, uh, it's not always clear that introducing additional uh, information would uh, improve your out-of-sample forecast so that's why it's also important to do this kind of validation period where you then do this out-of-sample forecast to see does this additional information help to improve your forecast so Remember that in this um, this example we had uh, quite a long time series of 151 years starting from 1861. So in general there is no 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 rule that that how this uh, data should be should be split between the estimation period or validation period. Very common choice is to to split it 50-50. Uh, so have equally large estimation period and validation period. But uh, in this specific example, I will use the first 100 years for the estimation period to ensure that there is uh, enough observations for the, for the, um, for to, to estimate the parameters and also that, uh, that uh, we do not have like too, too long history of the, of the data in this, uh, too long history in this in-sample fitting so that it would be still somewhat relevant to this out-of-sample period, which is the last 51 years from 1962 to 2012. But that's important point here to understand that, uh, that uh, to do this out of sample validation, we need to divide the sample in two parts. Um, one more point to before I proceed to the empirical example, the similar kind of out of sample validation could be also possible in the cross sectional data. So you could, for example, uh, randomly draw from your data set two subsamples. Uh, so if you had, for example, these uh, apartments in Espo, so we could do this kind of out of sample validation by, by randomly splitting this, uh, our full data set to two, two subsets. So for example, using some random number generation. And then we could see that how well, if we fit uh, to this uh, one of the random samples, subsamples, the model, how well the model could predict them in this uh, this other other subsample. So that's also possible to do in the case of uh, uh, cross-sectional data or perhaps even panel data. But in the case of time series data, it's of course uh, natural to start the estimation with the uh, chronologically older data and then use it for the newer data to, to validate. All right, so let's proceed to the empirical example. And uh, I will start with this um, AR1 model of inflation using the first 100 years of data. And uh, remember that this inflation rate, what I have indicated here by pi, so inflation rate, of course, uh, uh, should be stationary as we have already tested with the Dickey Fuller test earlier, uh, because notice that the inflation rate was already this uh, taking this first difference automatically. And indeed, when we estimate this autoregressive coefficient rho, we get the coefficient uh, 0 0.7195, uh, which is uh, uh, substantially lower than one. So, so indeed we have a, have a stationary series of inflation rate. And uh, so the two parameters that we need for the forecasting purposes are these, uh, these estimates of, uh, of mu and rho. So the estimate of rho is this 0 0.7195, and we have estimate as the drift parameter mu, so the estimate is 0 0.188765. So those coefficients we will then use later for to form the 
uh, one period of Fed, head forecast. And I come back to that a little bit later. So this AR1 model is the, is the one model that I will use for, for forecasting purposes, but I will also then utilize this ARDL1 one model. So I, I also consider that, okay, what if we introduce this information of the sunspot number to the, to the regressions? Can we improve actually the forecast? So here is then the, the results of the ARDL model. So uh, the autoregressive coefficient, the estimate of the autoregressive coefficient rho is 0 0.710182. And uh, the constant uh, mu is, uh, is still this uh, drift parameter. But now when we took the sunspot numbers, we have some very small coefficient for the, for the sunspot number and, uh, and the lacked value of the sunspot number. And like we remember from the previous examples, this uh, sunspot number is uh, almost statistically significant. So if you look at the p-value, we see that at the 10% significance level, the sunspot number would be significant, but not at 5% significance level. So this was this sort of dilemma we ended up earlier. So now we can get, get like ultimate uh, uh, answer to this, that uh, because um, obviously if you look at the R squared statistic here, we have 0 0.535. So keep that in mind, 0 0.535. If we go back to this uh, AR1 model, which just included the inflation rate, we have 0 0.5177. So we see that the R squared statistic increases to some extent when we introduce the sunspot number. Very little, but, uh, but it does increase. And uh, this is, of course, the, the property of the OLS estimator that if we introduce additional explanatory variables, the R squared statistic will always, always uh, increase, or it, at least it cannot decrease. Okay, but uh, but this is of course we are fitting now in this uh, in this estimation period. The OLS estimate is uh, is um, maximizing the R squared statistic in some sense. So it's not surprising that in the in sample we find that the R squared statistic will be will be better. But the question is then, does it help to improve the forecast in the in the out of sample? So this uh, this uh, um, this uh, red period in the in this, uh, in this so this validation period and this is why we do this out of sample validation so in this case then it's not self-evident that introducing an additional variable will help to improve the forecast so here i have illustrated the out of sample uh, out of sample forecast and one period ahead forecast of the inflation rate for this last 51 years of the time series. So I have illustrated here this, uh, what is the uh, actual observed inflation rate? So that is this blue curve. And then uh, the red curve is uh, indicating this uh, uh, forecast with this AR1. So how do I form the, form the forecast? So, so that's something that is good to, good to walk you through. So remember that in, in the previous uh, Stata results, we have these uh, parameter estimates for mu and rho. So I will take those from this, uh, this estimation period uh, of the first 100 years. So this is, would be what I have indicated this uh, uh, mu hat and rho hat. So it's very common notation in, uh, in uh, econometrics and statistics to put this kind of hat on top of the parameter to indicate that this is the, this is the estimate or estimator also. So then I use those kind of estimated parameters. And then the idea here is that I can observe this, uh, this inflation in the period, previous period. So the idea here is that I would take this mu t minus one, which I could observe in period t minus one, and then I use it to make this one period ahead forecast. So the idea is that, for example, if we are in year, year 2000, we, we observe the inflation rate, and then we use this parameter estimates of mu and rho to form a forecast for the next year, 2001. And here I have done this kind of uh, uh, subsequently one year by time. It's easy to do it, for example, in Excel, when you have these parameter estimates and you have observed this previous value. So you just make this forecast. And this is how I have uh, formed this kind of 
inflation forecast, which is this uh, red color curve. So the blue blue curve is uh, what happened in reality, and red one is uh, is the forecast. So if you if you if you now look at this uh, this uh, how well our forecast is performing, then uh, I would say that uh, this simple AR1 model has uh, remark remarkably good fit to this uh, this uh, actual inflation rate, uh, especially within the first decades of this series. So notice that in the since the about 1992, then this uh, this actual inflation and our forecast start to drift apart. So this is in some sense not surprising because uh, because uh, remember that this um, estimation period was from 1861 to 1961, and uh, for example, in the latest decades when Finland has been part of the monetary union. And the inflation rate has been, as a result, also also relatively small. So obviously, this kind of simple time series model cannot adjust these parameters to the to this kind of um, changes, uh, such as, for example, Finland joining the European Union or the, or the Monetary Union. So during the whole EU membership of Finland, then the the actual inflation has been uh, notably lower than this AR1 forecast. But during this um, First thirty years or so, the the AR one model was uh, was doing really really well. So it would be very difficult to to beat this kind of simple AR one in terms of forecasting this kind of kind of time series, as you can obviously see in the in this diagram. What about then this AR DL model? If we if we introduce the the, the um, sunspot number to the equation. So uh, here is the, the same thing. So we would also then utilize this, what I have here indicated is beta 2 and beta 3 coefficients. And I put this hat on top of that, meaning that also those coefficients have been, have been estimated during this uh, time period of 1861 to 1961. And here I just take them as given and utilize the sunspot number to form the inflation. So notice that now this inflation forecast uh, changes a little bit. So it seems to me that uh, that with the sunspot number, this uh, our forecast is uh, um, missing this this uh, uh, high peak of uh, inflation during the oil crisis in the 1970s. But then uh, during this um, EU membership of Finland, then then the inflation uh, seems to get a little bit better. The forecast seems to get a little bit better than in this uh, uh, in this uh, AR1 model. So. Just by visual inspection, it's very difficult to tell which of these two models, is it AR1 model or ARDL11 model, uh, performs better. So that's why then for, during this uh, out-of-sample validation, we then usually measure the precision by so-called root mean squared error, or sometimes just mean squared error without the square root. But um, the idea here is that we then compare this uh, this during this uh, out of sample validation period, so here it was this 1962 to 2012. In this equation, this uh, this uh, pi hat is this inflation forecast that our model gives, and pi is this actual value because of course we observe these historical values of inflation rate. So that that's why we use this out of sample validation period because we can actually observe. What was the inflation in the in the real world, and how well our forecast was performing then against this uh, this actual inflation? So, because this um, this our forecast may be underestimating or overestimating, so that's why this uh, we use the squared term here. We take uh, sum over all all observations during this out of sample validation period and divide by the number of periods, so fifty one periods we had there, and. I like to also take the square root, so then it is easier to interpret this uh, this uh, um, error because then then the error is in the same same units as uh, as the original inflation. So if you had inflation inflation rate in percentages, then also root mean squared error would be measured in percentages. Whereas if we have a mean squared errors, it would be percentage to power two. So that's not so easy to easy to interpret but uh, but for the comparative purposes mean squared error would be also just fine 
So I have calculated this root mean squared error statistics for these two models. Uh, so AR1 model and ARDL1 model for this uh, out of sample forecasting uh, for the um, 51 years. And uh, so the precision error is about 2.8% in both both models. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, you could think about it that, uh, as uh, kind of error margin that that plus or minus 2.8%, which is quite a large, of course. So as I said, it is it is difficult to uh, predict the future. And uh, interestingly, there is a small, uh, small improvement in, in favor of this ARDL model compared to AR1 model only. So in this case, of course, we don't need to care is it significant improvement or not in any kind of improvement in the in the in the forecasting precision would be welcome, of course, in the in the real world. So so as I said, it's not self evident that that uh, adding an additional variable, even even such kind of uh, a very far fetched variable like this uh, sunspot number, uh, we don't really care if it is significant or not. The question here is: Does it improve the forecasting precision or not? And uh, in this case, we observe some some. Uh, some improvement indeed so it's marginal very very marginal improvement but uh, but indeed uh, some improvement and of course uh, we could then ask that okay is it worth to include it maybe there's some other other variables that would be uh, would be more important to control for for example i mentioned already the eu membership or the uh, membership in the monetary union which would be potentially such kind of structural breaks that uh, that would be important to take into account in the model. But ultimately, anyway, uh, based on this exercise that I, I wanted to kind of, uh, I, I started with the idea that the sunspot number would prove to be such kind of spurious uh, uh, regression that uh, doesn't have any any predictive power, but uh, but uh, uh, it turned out to have some some predictive power, even though just just marginally which was kind of a surprising result to me, at least. So I think that illustrates you that, in, as I summarize now, it's important to divide this our, our time, time period to these two parts. If you, do, if you want to test our forecasting ability, then use this kind of estimation uh, in sample period to fit the parameters, but also don't forget to take this kind of uh, um, validation Period. So for the out of sample validation of the model, that's critically important. And then for this precision of the forecast during this out of sample validation, you can use uh, statistics such as root mean squared error to, to objectively measure the precision. But uh, in this course, we only, only sort of scratch the surface of the time series forecasting. So I want to advertise here this. Uh, a new course titled Predictive Analytics uh, that uh, will be organized in the fourth period uh, in the spring. Uh, so uh, the title suggests that it, it would be kind of perhaps more um, machine learning flavored course, uh, but uh, actually the focus of the course will be quite heavily on the on the time series models in general and and uh, and uh, time series forecasting. So uh, that can be, and that's of course the master level course. I should also also point out. So thank you for your attention, and uh, in the next video I will move to the to the panel data models, which combine the time series dimension and the cross sectional cross sectional element. Thanks.